Okay, thank you, Duzer. Uh, well, let me just uh, welcome you all for this uh, third day of our workshop on open quantum dynamics and thermodynamics. Today, the first talk will be given by uh, Armen Alavardian from Alikhanian National Lab, Armenia. He is going to talk about work extraction from fluid flow, the analog of kernel efficiency. So, Armen, floor is now. Yes, so, thank you very much. Uh, Louis Korea from University of Exeter, UK. Could you please, Louis, could you please uh, share your uh, slides? Sure. <clears throat> and on that now. Okay. So please let me know if you see them. Yeah, I can see you properly. Okay. Okay, so yeah, so we are almost at a time. So okay, let us first welcome Louis for this uh, next talk. And his title of his talk is Local Master Equation by Pass the Secular Approximation. Okay, before starting the talk, I just asked wanted to ask you that we're going to record your talk. Is it okay with you? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Okay, now you can start. Floor is yours. So, uh, just to, I mean, you, you can hear me, right? Because my Zoom, for some reason, says my microphone is muted, but. Yeah, you, be... can, okay. you can hear it properly. Okay, excellent. So, yeah, thanks very much for the introduction. And also, I'd like to say that it's, it's very nice that these workshops are being organized, especially, you know, these days we cannot see each other face to face anymore. It's particularly important, I would say, to keep the community alive and, you know, having these things is really nice. So, uh, yeah, well, that's the title of my talk. I'm going to be talking about master equations and, uh, yeah, mostly about open systems alone, but then also a bit about thermodynamic implications. And, uh, yeah, so in particular, I will show you how local master equations can be superior to, say, global equations that rely on the secular approximation. And uh, for this, of course, I have to explain what I mean by local master equations and specifically secular approximation, what kind of secular approximation, if I'm talking about quartz graining or something else. And uh, yeah, before I go, just to say this is the archive identifier. I hope you can see my uh, cursor, my mouse. Um, this is a joint, but it's not joint work, it's work by Stefano Scali, who's the PhD student of Janet Anders and uh, myself. And uh, yeah, one thing to clarify that I always tend to do in talks is, first of all, where is Exeter, right? So many people don't know. It's in the Southwest of England and it's in a ridiculously beautiful county of Devon. It's really, really beautiful. So it really doesn't look like England at all, at least for you know, a period of like half of the year from March to June. So these are actual pictures I took during a workshop we were hosting was the last thing we hosted before, you know, the, the whole pandemic uh, broke. Uh, it was in late uh, 2019 and there was still good weather. Then it started raining and it just stops now. Yeah, but, you know, so uh, yeah, in, in Exeter, besides uh, hiking and, and surfing and the beach and all of these things, we have some uh, thermodynamics and open quantum systems going on. And in particular, I've just started as a new lecturer building my own little group on open quantum systems and kind of, you know, topics that we, we deal with, uh, strong dissipation. Uh, now we're also thinking a little bit about uh, like non-Markovian dissipation with, with driving, uh, stuff dealing with master equations like this talk, just weak dissipation and Markovian. Uh, applications to quantum thermodynamics, quantum uh, thermal machines, and uh, also we have a strong interest in uh, parameter estimation theory, and in particular estimating uh, temperature precisely. So, you know, if, uh, and of course in Exeter, there is uh, the big group by Professor Janet Anders, who is also around in the, in the conference, and uh, she's, she's also dealing with information thermodynamics and non-equilibrium non, non stuff, and the fluctuation theorems and so on. And uh, yeah, if you, if you want to, well, of course not now, right? But you know, when the situation clears, uh, we're very happy also to, to get guests and if you want to get in touch, uh, you know, here are some contact details. You can also contact me later and you know, get looking forward to organize your visit to Devon. I will take you hiking and we'll do some nice thermodynamics. Okay, so, okay, that's the advertisement part. Let's get with the talk. Okay, so it's very simple uh, outline that I have here first, 
very long motivation. So I just will state the problem in the end, but I have to give you a little bit of background. I know that might not be necessary because Gabriele was uh, uh, scheduled to give his talk uh, yesterday, which I couldn't come, unfortunately, but I, I suppose that most of these things he covered, but I will refresh now. And then very briefly, I will talk about our results, which involve this notion of exceptional points. Okay, so let's, uh, yeah, let's begin. So, of course, I, I know that this workshop is about uh, master, well, about open system dynamics, so I shouldn't explain what the master equation is, just to make uh, a few points about the, the type of system that I will be thinking about. It's an interacting uh, multi-parted system, what I have in mind always, and it can be connected to any number of heat paths. Uh, but uh, in all my pictures, I would put two of them. When I mean heat bath, I really mean it. So I am talking about uh, uh, infinitely large uh, system in a proper canonical equilibrium state. And uh, the, the initial state, that's the only uh, restriction I'm going to put, uh, has to be uncorrelated from the system. Okay, that's, that's the only thing. And I want to always talk about uh, equations of motion that can be derived from the exact uh, reduced dynamics of the system uh, through you know, perturbation theory in the system bath interaction as usual, right? So fine, uh, what, what would be the, the thing that you would wish your master equation would do? Well, from purely you know, mathematical considerations, you just want your master equation to, to be mapping physical states into physical states and that's it, doesn't have to do anything else. Uh, you can do that uh, in, a, in a close form, elegant way. If you f also assume that your dynamics forms what is known as quantum dynamical semigroup, that, you know, as you know, what I mean here is that if this uh, phi here represents the map that takes your initial state to any later time, what I'm assuming is that you can stop this uh, propagation at any intermediate time, and you can write that as the composition of a map that first you know, evolves your initial state until your intermediate time s, and then it continues evolving it up to time t with a map that is also positive, but it only depends on the time difference, t minus s, okay? So that's that's uh, often equated to being Markovian, memoryless, and so on, quantum dynamical semigroup property after all. So with, with these two assumptions, well, not, not really like that, there are some additional technical assumptions, but let's just brush these details under the, under the carpet and just say these two assumptions, you get a close form master equation, like, you know, a Limblet form master equation. But you could get more uh, ambitious and you could add additional requirements to your master equation. So you may uh, ask that if you want to do thermodynamics with your master equation, you would like to, to have something that looks a bit like classical thermodynamics. So our baths, starting in a canonical state, they are stationary in, in their own uh, local Hamiltonians, uh, we would like our bats to take our system and bring it to a thermal state of equilibrium, okay? So if we have the same temperatures everywhere, we want thermalization, or we at least would expect thermalization. And um, also we can impose this strict energy conservation, you know, in this form is written here, which in a way is, is telling us that the system bath boundary is not accumulating energy, right? So energy is either in the, in the in environments or in the system and the, you know, the, the sum is, is roughly constant or is actually exactly constant. So good, so that's, uh, that's what- Sorry, Luis, can, I, can yeah. I interrupt you for a second there, please? So with the last assumption that you have with no energy stored in the system bath boundary, isn't this the same as what one would normally call as a dephasing master equation that you would get? and but with that, uh, you see the, the populations, they, they always seem to oscillate, whereas the coherences, they decay out. So what's the, I, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure whether I'm on the right track or not, because they're generally thermodynamics doesn't make sense. So. Yeah, when you impose this strict energy conservation, you, you get, I mean, this is what I'm going to show now. I mean, with these three uh, additional considerations, what you get is what, what would be a, a global master equation. So a master equation in which the dissipative part is um, uh, it's, it's related to the system Hamiltonian and it's not just some arbitrary thing in Limblet form. Uh, you can have a defacing term in general in that equation, it can come naturally, but you may also not have it. So I'm, I'm really, I, that depends on the 
the Hamiltonian on the system you have, but I'm afraid I'm not quite follow the implication that thermodynamics don't make sense. Or I mean, what do uh, you mean no, exactly? I, I was thinking. Problem? Sorry, I was I was just thinking. Maybe I was on the wrong track. Then I was thinking that if with the last condition that you have, which yeah. is no energy stored, this is always a dephasing master equation. But you say this is not true. It's not well, always. It's not. It, it it does have explicit dephasing terms in general, but it doesn't have to. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, if, the, if the Hamiltonian has not only dephasing terms, but also uh, transfer terms, then the last equation is satisfied only approximately in the uh, master equation level. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah. I mean, this is an e equality here. So I, I was just curious when this is exactly true, it would be always dephasing i'm guessing but I, I could be wrong here i mean i think this is where my confusion so what is. what what the if you think about the at the map level i mean it's actually not my result right so th this is another paper by yes. uh, Rohi Dan and ronnie koslo but uh, the thing is um so what, what i seem to remember here is that if you impose a strict energy conservation what happens is that your uh if, if you can then break your map between um a part that is dissipative only and a part that is unitary only just composed one another, you can flip them. So you have this phase covariance type of uh, situation, which you only have when you have a global master equation. As long as you have non-secular terms in your equation, you don't have this, this, um, this ability to flip the unitary evolution only and then do the dissipative evolution afterwards and get the full map. You know, and, and if you do it the other way around, you get the same thing. So that's that's what happens when you put this strict energy conservation. You don't have to, right? So you, you could say sure. this is approximate, like you know, so uh, I don't, I don't know who said that, but it's right. I mean, it could be to second order, you know, only or something. But, but you know, this is really not my point. I probably shouldn't have emphasized so much. It's not crucially important, right? So we can maybe. Thank continue. you. So yeah. Um, so if you just, you know, impose the, the, you like mathematical conditions, you end up having a master equation of this form. Which, which could also have this defacing terms addition uh, added to, to it, but it doesn't have to. And it's in, in, in well, this is Gorini, Kosakovsky, Sudarsh, and Limblet uh, form that you see there that, you know, we all know and so on. But uh, the point is that these rates here are just some positive constants. And these operators here can be any operators that, uh, that work on the Hilbert space of the system. And they don't have to be supported in the, in the entire Hilbert space, they could be local operators if you want, as we will see in a moment. But if you impose this additional things, what happens, and this is the reference I was talking about. Um, so what happens is that you get a Limblad form, a master equation in which the jump operators, they have to, to be satisfying this, this eigen operation, uh, operator equation with the system Hamiltonian. So they cannot be uh, whatever anymore. They actually have to, to obey certain commutation rule with the system Hamiltonian. And uh, you know these this omegas here that appear labeling the, the, the different decay channels are now uh, bore frequencies of the system, as you know. So there, there are uh, two or, or more energies of the system whose difference is exactly this frequency that appears here. So there, there could be several transitions that, that uh, are involved in one decay channel. But you, you, know, you have to look at the spectrum of your uh, Hamiltonian. These guys cannot be whatever you want. So that's the point I wanted to make. And um, let's just uh, rewind a little bit. So when we don't impose anything on our jump operators in the master equation, it's certainly you know, legitimate to take, for instance, uh, like uh, raising and lowering operators that in, in this uh, in this picture here, for instance, would act locally only on the part of your system which is directly coupled to the heat bath in question. So this is what I want to signify here with the colors. The dissipation superoperator in blue would only act on the Hilbert space of the nearest uh, directly coupled node of my. Uh, multi-component system. And the same goes for the, the red uh, dissipation superoperator with some like, I don't know, racing lowering operators or something like that, that operates here only. And uh, as, as far as uh, these dissipators go, then they would know nothing about how many other nodes there are, how they are connected with one another. So this, this dissipative pro process in a way is completely or could be completely disconnected from the actual unitary dynamics that would be otherwise going on in the system. However, 
if you impose those additional conditions that I was talking about, because your jump operators have to know about the full Hamiltonian of the system, what happens is that dissipation becomes global. So if you just couple the system to one heat path, this heat path can globally act on the entire system. Okay, so that's we know how it works. And the same would go for the cold dissipation super operator. So when the two of them are on, you can actually do a microscopic derivation of the of the master equation if you just have the Hamiltonian. Okay, so that's another nice thing about this global master equation. Uh, actually, I didn't say it before, but it was written in huge letters uh, up. So this is what I call local master equation for obvious reasons, right? So this clarifies part of the title already. This is what I mean. Uh, when you have the global uh, case, let me just go a little bit slow. Aha, uh -huh, there you go. So you can uh, find these jump operators from the Hamiltonian. That would be the system Hamiltonian. That would be the baths involved. There could be two or more, or, or one. And this is the system bath coupling term, where this B here belongs to the bath, and this S belongs to the system. You just have to take your S. You have to decompose, like I know you know perfectly well, but I just have to say to be on the same page. You decompose these S's in uh, eigenoperators of the system Hamiltonian, satisfying this condition here. And you know these rates that appear in the equation, well, you, you can calculate them if you know your spectral density, that's just the details of the interaction between system and bath and the temperature at which the bath is. This is the bosonic occupation number if your bath is bosonic. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about global and local master equations. Um, so there's one thing, a very controversial slide here, that uh, local master equations are usually uh, problematic. Okay, so what happens is that you can very easily find things that don't look thermodynamically nice. You know, this is precisely because we didn't impose those additional thermodynamic inspired conditions when we derived this equation. So for instance, if you put these two temperatures to equal, you would expect or you would like thermalization to occur, or at least something close to thermalization within you know, the validity of the master equation, but this actually does not happen. Okay, so you can go very far from a thermal state, even you know, when dissipation is very weak. And so this is, uh, this is a problem. Uh, you could also get two different temperatures. And if certain relationship exists between the frequencies and the temperatures and so on, you can get the heat flow against the temperature grade, which is you know, also a clear violation of the second law of thermodynamics. Not such a nice thing if you want to do, then draw thermodynamic uh, conclusions from your uh, quantum uh, open system analysis. And the other thing is that, for instance, if you are studying heat engines or refrigerators and so on, if you model a thermodynamic cycle with these equations, well, you can solve things and so on, but that will mask some, some effects that are actually dominant when, when the efficiency is maximized, which is heat leaks. If you have heat leaks, well, usually you don't care so, so much about them if you're working at maximum power and things like this, but if you want to go close to the maximum efficiency, they become the dominant effect and they are missed by this local uh, approach because it's, it's, a, it's a global effect. It's an effect that uh, heat bath has on the entire system and actually in, on the far end of the system. And this is clearly not captured by a local equation. So there are issues with this local equation and the way I'm putting it here, it really seems like we should just ditch this local equation, use the global one and we're done, right? But, you know, Problem is that the local equation works and it works surprisingly well. And it's, it's very surprising that the equation having these issues, then it's also able to describe correctly experimental results. You can model experiments with just local equation and everything works nicely. And, and you can then ask yourself, well, maybe there's something you know, deeper that we are not really seeing about the local equation that makes it uh, worthwhile studying. And uh, you know, there's, there's various ways to try to justify the local approach in a rigorous way. So I'm just uh, showing you this uh, paper by Anton Tuszewski here, who I think is around. Um, actually, in this slide, there should be another reference, which I um, apologize that it's not there, but I just typed it up. It came out yesterday, right? So Anton has a new paper, Anton Trusheskin, in archives yesterday, quite interesting, uh, talking about uh, systematic uh, extension of this uh, approach to, to all cases, like justifying the local equation. So I recommend you to, to go look at that. And I apologize, the reference didn't come up, 
So, uh, okay, so the, the idea here is that imagine now I denote the internal interactions between the nodes of my system by this K, and I assume this K is weak. So then I can do perturbation theory, and I can expand my dissipation super operators in this small parameter K, just by expanding the, the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues in K, if I can do that. And what happens if I can do that is that the lowest order term in the, in the expansion becomes the local uh, dissipation superoperator. So in a way, I'm truncating the master equation when I write this local equation, and it's, a, it's a, the expression, if you like, that the global master equation would have in the limit of very low internal coupling, okay? So that's what that's, would be kind of making sense of this equation. So uh, just a side remark, which is important to make, uh, a lot has been done about collisional models recently. And what I mean here is that instead of having like these passive paths, okay, you could also have active paths, which you have some environmental units that come and interact strongly with the system uh, for a very short uh, period of time. And you can try to derive the, the effective equation of motion for this uh, system in the middle that comes out of this unitary dynamics, where you have these conveyor belts of environment units that go just, uh, uh, you know, infinitely coming and going from the system. And the equation of motion of that is actually exactly given by the local mass equation. Okay, so the, in this case, it's not an approximation. In this case, it's the thing that is happening. And, and yeah, a, a lot has been said about this. So for instance, this nice paper by Felipe Barra where, where this equation is derived. And then recently the thermodynamic implications of this thing have been discussed within the context of quantum thermodynamics here, Gabriele and collaborators. So in a way that the picture I'm painting is that the global master equation is somewhat superior to the local master equation because you get the local from the global by doing an additional uh, weak coupling assumption. So this global master equation, of course, comes from a more general equation or a more accurate equation, which has the issues of its own that I don't want to go into at the moment. This is not about the Redfield in this talk, but you know we can talk days about the Redfield equation if you want. Uh, thing is, uh, Redfield equation uh, is a smart, general, complicated equation in which you can make the secular approximation, which is just an uh, average of fast oscillations that appear, and you get this uh, global Lindblad form master equation. Here, by Redfield equation, for the experts in the audience, I mean Markovian Redfield with no lamp shift and under a kind of secular uh, approximation, which is partial. So I already started doing the secular approximation and I got rid of the fastest oscillations of them all. And I just keep those oscillations that are not so fast. Okay, that's, that's what I mean specifically. And uh, well, these Redfield equations can be derived uh, systematically from the exact open dynamics, you know, under weak dissipation assumption, if you make a perturbative expansion in the, in the exact uh, master equation. And, you know, I know everyone has written almost a derivation of this, but we, we wrote another one in the paper, which is there in the corner. So you could also have a look in the appendix. I believe it's quite neat, the derivation, but anyway, good. So this is uh, kind of the, hier the hierarchy that comes, you know, from these considerations. And what we saw after you know, doing what I'm going to tell in the rest of the uh, time that I have, is uh, we saw that this hierarchy is not quite right. Actually, you can think of it in this way. You know, the Redfield equation, you can go, depending on what you do to it, you can go to the local master equation or you can go to the global master equation, depending on whether you do the secular approximation or whether you focus first on doing the weak internal coupling expansion. And a similar picture uh, can be seen if you, instead of doing what we are going to do now, uh, you do a coarse graining type of master equation. So, so that's a systematic way of uh, averaging out the fast oscillations in the secular approximation. If you do it one way, you can get the local master equation. If you do it another way, you can get the global one. So actually this picture is consistent with what, what is known about this. Sorry, okay. uh, Luis, may yes? I interrupt you for a quick sure. second? So are you saying that you don't need the secular approximation in order to get the local master equation? Yes. So from the red field? Yeah. I don't need the secular. I can just do weak internal coupling and get to the local. Is, yes, is that... with, yes, with a caveat, as usual, okay? So uh -huh. in Redfield, I mean specifically partial Redfield uh, equation without lamp shift, which is saying a lot. Okay, it's not right. just so, the full Redfield with everything. That would be true. not, not uh, uh -huh. working. 
But if you just take the Redfield equation, uh, partial Redfield equation, without Lamshut, right. you can show that if you have an open system where the nodes that couple to a heat band, they couple with only one single bore frequency. So that's also important. You cannot have you can have like a qubit coupled to a bath, oscillator coupled to a bath, but you I cannot see. have like a three-level system with different uh, energy space. So that is not allowed. Mm. Uh, then you get the local equation. Otherwise, you get a quasi-local equation with additional funny terms. But it's also very okay. close to it. Thank you. Okay, uh, but good, very good question. So Okay, so the, the whole point of the brief the time I have left is uh, our question is not really this, right? Our question is, if you are in a situation where you can both trust the weak internal coupling assumption and you know that the secular approximation holds, then which one should you use? Should you use the global master equation or the local master equation? And actually, you should use the local master equation and you will see why in a moment. Okay, so that's the uh, biggest part. Now it's just results and plots and, and you know, I hope it's going to be, it will be faster now. So, good. The model that we're looking at to, to actually do the calculations is the simplest possible network that we can think of, uh, which is just two harmonic oscillators coupled to each other linearly and uh, linearly coupled as well and weakly to two heat bands, which are just bosonic as well. So everything is bosonic and linear in this system, meaning that every Gaussian state will remain Gaussian, meaning that if I want to fully characterize the system, and in particular, yeah, the system, if I want to fully characterize my reduced uh, dynamics, all I need is um, the, the first order moments and the second order moments. So these are 14 dynamical variables for a two oscillator thing. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the master equation and I'm not going to say which master equation. This is a generic master equation. This could be Redfield. If I put the Redfield dissipators in here, it could be global or it could be local. You know? But in general, it will have this form. This is slightly different from what I showed before because this is the adjoint master equation. I want to write it in the Heisenberg picture now. So I want to apply it on operators and not on the state. Uh, and which operators I get? Well, I just gave that up. I'm going to choose the first, uh, well, the, the, the quadratures of my system, and then also the second order moments, the covariances of my system. So I know if I'm given these covariances and uh, the first order moments and the covariances, I can for sure fully characterize the state of my system. Perhaps I don't need so many variables. That's, that could be, okay, because there's some resonance in my system because I take the two oscillators to have the same frequency. Or perhaps you could choose other 14 variables if you like. The, the point is that if you choose all the necessary variables, your equation of motion will close on itself. So if you apply this a master equation to every single one of these observables, you will get a linear uh, first order differential equation like this, where all variables close on themselves. And this uh, non-Hermitian matrix of coefficients is encompassing all the information or playing the role if you like of the master equation now. So it's this matrix that appears in this linear differential equation. In our specific case, which is besides the point, uh, you know, the part that uh, depends on the first order moments decoupled from the part that depends on the second order moments, just because of the model that we're looking at. It doesn't have to be the case. This is a technical thing. I probably shouldn't have even included that. In general, you get something like this. So are we good with this? And this is how I write the master equation in terms of some dynamical variables. Uh, Louis, just a quick question. Um, is uh, sorry, this is a silly question, but uh, always in the adjoint master equation, uh, you have to be careful to add a particular noise number right, to maintain the commutator. Is this to add the particular? Sorry, what? You have to kind of keep on keep a noise term to kind of maintain the commutators, right? Do you know what I mean? No, I, but I don't understand what you say. What what is it? You have to do what? Okay, we can just talk about this offline. Yeah, no, never mind. But but really, it's a rewriting of it. So what, what I mean here, I don't know what you have in mind, but it's, it's really writing the same equation. What you do is you, you take the observable you like, and you, you um, take the trace of the observable you like times the time, the, the time derivative of the state, and you use the cyclic property of the trace and get rid of the state. That's, that's what you do. Yeah, yeah, and now if you compute, let's say, XP commutator, and yes. you take the, you know, so, you know, you take the derivative of it and uh, you plug in what 
the dx by dt is from your equation, the commutator is no longer satisfied typically. So you need to add one more term in the adjoint master equation. Um, you know, it's kind of like a Langevin noise term basically. But maybe this is a this is a you know maybe I'm just missing some technical detail here, which is yeah. Well, I I really don't know what you mean, but uh, yeah, I want to discuss okay. this, uh, later with you. Okay, I, I I'll just point this out to you offline. Yeah, never okay. mind. Good. So yeah, okay. So this is what you get. That's how you transform your problem into this uh, linear uh, differential equation, and you have to look at the properties now of this matrix, this non-emission matrix, and carries all the information about the master equation, and you just want to solve this thing. Now, what happens when you have a degeneracy in the spectrum of this matrix? What happens is that you have an incomplete spectrum in the sense that, yes, you have the eigenvalues and some of them may coincide. That's degeneracy, but it's not normal degeneracy, it's non emission degeneracy. And when you try to find the eigenvectors, you, you, feel, you, you see that you can't. You only have one eigenvector per degenerate subspace. So you cannot span the full uh, Hilbert space of the system or not Hilbert space, but you know this higher dimensional space. We are in Liouville space now. So you cannot expand Liouville space anymore. And when this happens, or if this happens, for some specific combination of parameters of your model, then you say you have an exceptional point. And uh, you have several ways to characterize this, but if you just look at the condition number of this matrix, uh, you realize that it diverges exactly at the exceptional point. The condition matrix just uh, if you look at this uh, matrix as the matrix of coefficients of some linear uh, system of equations, uh, it, it measures how ill-defined the system is in the sense of how sensitive it is to small random errors. And, and this is what you calculate like this. You know, it's just operator norm of the, of the matrix times operator norm of the inverse, which you can define even if the matrix is singular. And I'm not going to go into this. You can calculate this thing, okay? So we, in this uh, thing, David, uh, sorry, sorry, what? Sorry. You have five minutes almost. Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. Um, I'm done. Just show you oh. two plots and I'm done. Okay. Uh, so, Luis, can I ask you, uh, yeah? uh, sorry, Luis, uh, can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Yeah, so this matrix MD uh, captures uh, evolution for all these operators, right? Uh, that you are yes. sort of enclosing, which to make the sort of a closed set of equation. Does this matrix in general, so this is very unusual than uh, I would say the uh, the master equation in a sense, right? I mean, uh, where Liouvillian typically have very nice, interesting properties that the real part of eigenvalues should be uh, negative and zero eigenvalue, which will take you to the steady state and so on and so forth. Uh, is there any interesting property of this matrix MD in general? Or like, I mean, I don't know what you mean, interesting property, like, um... <clears throat> It is, uh, I mean, this is the uh, propagator. Oh, and you so here, this, here, this when looking at what exactly, here, when you're looking at the degeneracy, what exactly it tries to tell us? Uh, I, the was, uh, I, there was some kind of blurry thing that I didn't hear what you said. Oh, was... sorry. But so what I'm saying is that when you're looking at the degeneracy of this matrix, uh, uh -huh. can you tell us like what exactly uh, it's implying, this degeneracy here in this matrix? I do mean the exceptional point, though. What exactly that physically uh, imply? Or, uh, is there anything? Well, interesting yeah, what, what it implies. I mean, I don't know if this uh, answer is very satisfactory. There is the reference there that I recommend you by by uh, uh, well, it's, uh, Ronnie Kosloff and collaborators there, um, uh, where they speak more in length about what it means. But if you just want to write uh, mathematically the solution to this uh, first order differential equation. You you need you really need to exponentiate the, the the matrix there to to diagonalize it and if you cannot diagonalize it you have to do to bring it to to, to Jordan block form and so on so what what means essentially is that um, the time dependence of an observable does not follow the expression you would expect okay so at, at, it's like at uh, short times it's uh, it's a power law type of thing instead of an exponential thing or something like that. I don't remember, but the expressions, I mean, you can just work out the expressions, what you get, if you cannot diagonalize this matrix of coefficients, just solving mm -hmm. the, the system, right? So it, it has a dynamical signature. You know, it's not a massive thing. It's just a slightly different uh, short time behavior. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but this slight difference, uh, for instance, you can use it to estimate a parameter because this is really a singularity, right? It depends on the model parameter. So imagine you want to estimate the model parameter you're moving the parameters around and you're looking for this specific dynamical signature, slightly different short time behavior of observables that you can measure somehow and detect very accurately. 
So that could be, for instance, a metrology protocol. And this is what I'm saying is what is written in this paper that we have that I run and so on. So, so, so that, that would be one thing. Huh? This signature can also be visible if I just write down the local master equation and look at the eigenspectre of the Neubelian? Yeah, that's right. I mean, this is oh, my oh, whole point. All right. So that, okay, <laughs> yes, I will see it in a plot now. Okay. okay. So that's, uh, yeah, you gave it away. That's, that's not fair. So um, that Sorry, was the okay. building the tension here that what happens when you look at the condition number if this matrix is made of your different uh, master equations, local, global, resident, okay, for this system that we have. And what you see is this. You see that the local master equation, but actually let me put this here. The local master equation has the exact same exceptional point structure that the Redfield equation. And in a way, which is very vague, but let me just say it like this. You can think of this uh, exceptional point uh, uh, distribution in, in parameter space of your model as a fingerprint of your dissipative dynamics in the sense that they are very sensitive. If you change anything in the matrix, they are likely to disappear or change. Okay, so if you have that precise, you know, it's very unlikely that you change the equation. That's what I'm saying. And we know this because we made a lot of mistakes while writing our master equation. If you change anything, if you get anything wrong, these exceptional points disappear or change completely. Okay, so what happens is that you can use them to, to, to be sure that it's the same dissipative dynamics in a way. But the master equation, when you do it globally, they disappear. It doesn't have this, this signature. It doesn't have these exceptional points anymore. So th there must be some, some actual signature, some difference between the dynamics according to the global master equation and the true dynamics as given by the Redfield equation and also surprisingly by the local equation when the coupling is weak, okay? So this is what we saw then. Well, this is the same thing, but with mathematics, if you do the same thing I said before about the um, the uh, expansion of this coefficient matrix um, rigorously as a serious expansion of the coupling parameter. If you look at the lowest order term of the global, that's not the same as the Redfield lowest order term, which is actually the same thing as the local mass equation with the caveats that I said before. Okay. So uh, another thing to, to appreciate how this is might be relevant for quantum thermodynamics is here is the steady state heat currents defined in the usual way uh, in this system that I have. So I have the two heat currents are you know, equal and they have different signs because I'm in steady state. And um, the, the, the red thing is the global master equation result. The dashed thing, I mean the continuous thing is the global, the dashed thing is the local master equation. And you can see for this point here, which happens to be the exceptional point, you can see they almost coincide. They don't quite coincide. If you zoom in, you see that there's a tiny difference, but it's tiny. So you could, you could think that either global or local equation for those parameters is fine. Okay, you could use global if you want, but you can't because if you look at what happens dynamically. Yes, the two states will coincide in the end, the one that comes from the global in the dashed here and the one that comes from the local in the continuous line here, but only in steady state, the dynamics is completely different like you can see here, okay? So in a normal cir circumstance, if I were to plot the blue dashed and the red dashed before doing this work and you ask me, Luis, what would you do if you wanted to study some thermodynamics in finite time with this model? Would you rather use the global or would you use the local? And I will tell you, well, the local has issues, just use the global, right? You, it's more trustworthy and we are in a regime where the secular approximation is supposed to hold. So you can use it. Actually, now that I know this, I know that the global misses some dynamical signature, then I would be more suspicious of the global. And actually, if I go and plot what the Redfield does, it does the same thing as the local, exactly in time. You know? Only if the coupling internally is very weak. Of course, if the coupling is not very weak, the local is nonsense, okay? So that's it. Uh, just take home message is that if you have this weakly interacting multipartite system, then if it's really weakly interacting, you should use the local master equation if you want to do dynamics. If you want to do steady state stuff, it's fine to use the global still. But you know, still there are the thermodynamic issues that are slightly unpleasant that the local master equation can have. Heat currents flow in the wrong way and stuff like that. So you actually have to be very careful. But in, in particular, this can be very practical if you're doing a um, many body open quantum system, if it's weakly interacting internally, it's not just that it's practically 
impossible to do a global master equation diagonalizing your full many body system but actually it's even better if you want to study dynamics to look at the local master equation which is is also more convenient uh, luckily so okay that's an archive identifier and i will just thank you for your attention thank you very much luis for a wonderful talk so we now have now we are running out of time we can have probably a couple of questions Maybe we start with Barinder. Quickly ask the question. Okay, okay, Louis. Since you are not using Sackler approximation to get your local mass equation, so what will guarantee the positivity of density matrix? Uh, well, it's it's in in limlet form, right? Okay, it's already in limlet it, form. It, it's still it's still, I mean the local is in limlet form. So so just because okay, of even the form, even without the form Sackler approximation. Yeah, because what I get truly is the local. So it's, I start with the partial Redfield equation, which is in principle not necessarily positive, but when yeah. you do the weak internal coupling approximation, you you get the Limblad equation, just like that. You don't have to do anything to get it. You the, the lowest order term in the expansion is already completely positive. All the non-positivity comes from the higher orders in the internal coupling. Okay, thank you. Okay, so maybe Joseph can ask. Yeah, uh, sorry, Lewis. In the last part of your talk, when you were referring to these exceptional points, right? Yes. Um, these, I mean, first of all, why do you call them exceptional points? Because of two things. One, exceptional points need a degeneracy in the eigenvalues as well as the eigenvectors. Yes. Okay. So uh, it's clear why you get a degeneracy in the eigenvalues, not so clear whether the eigenvectors coalesce or not. Um, uh... What, what do you mean? I mean, if you have an exceptional point, it's because the eigenvectors coalesce. I mean, that's another way to, to define when you have an exceptional So in, point. in your case, you, the eigenvectors do coalesce, the eigenvectors. Yeah, 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 sure, yes. So you can prove, and this is something we, I mean, you can prove mm -hmm. this one line, right? But you can prove that this condition number we're looking at, it's, it's an if and only if. If the condition number diverges, it's because left and right eigenvectors uh, sure. are, are overlapping. Okay. And uh, just curious because sorry, in orthogonal. Sorry, of... sorry, sorry. I just said overlapping. The left and right eigenvectors in an exceptional point have to be orthogonal, not orthogonal. orthogonal right. Yeah. Yes. So just but, curious yeah. because there have been these quite a few works by Prozen, Victor Albert about these open system degeneracies, right? Where you get basically coalescence of the eigenvalues and uh, yeah, basically multiple steady states. Looks like the same thing in a different sort of language. Uh, is this correct interpretation or am I missing I, something? I really am not familiar with these things that you mentioned, yes, so I, I wouldn't be able to tell, but okay. you know, in, in the context of uh, of open systems and thermodynamics and so on, the only yeah. two things that I was aware of are these, actually these two papers by Ronnie Kostler, one about uh, kind of more metrology, which I showed somewhere here, and the other one was uh, about, uh, about limit existence of limit cycles in a quantum auto cycle, which might be more connected with what you're saying, but I, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Well, we can discuss this later. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, maybe Tobias can ask the question. Just quickly ask the question. Uh, me or what? Yeah. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, um, you. You said a few words to the microscopic derivation from this von Markov Redfield equation. And if I remember correctly, in certain regimes, the Redfield equation becomes uh, uh, in the singular coupling limit uh, a, um, a, a local master, a, a local Lindbad equation. So that is essentially if you assume a high temperature. So I wonder what the, uh, uh, can you make a few words on what, what the temperature is in the, in the plots you also showed? So what, what role does well, it? Well, the temperature is, uh, well, in the plots, I wouldn't be able to, I don't remember, but it, it seems of the same order of the energy scale of the system. I mean, it's just order one in the, if the frequency of the system, the more frequencies are all order one, the temperature is of the same order in arbitrary units of K, K and H bar equals to one. So they, they, they have thermal excitations of the same size as uh, okay, uh, all of the other system uh, time sc uh, energy scales. Uh, about the, uh, whether the red field and the singular coupling and, and what the relation is, I wouldn't be able to tell. No, I hadn't thought about the singular coupling limit here, actually. But uh, yeah, it might be good to look at this. I, I, I don't know. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK, this is the last question from Jungun. 
you just ask the question. Uh, yes, yeah, just short question. Uh, so uh, my question is about the legitimacy of the internal coupling because you mentioned the weak, uh, weak internal coupling. So should internal coupling be smaller than uh, let's say system bus coupling to uh, yeah, no, no, local it, master it, equation? No, no, actually you, you, you have a really nice discussion in, in this paper by Anton uh, Tusheshkin. Uh, I will try to, no, this is very slow. I will try to go back there. But essentially uh, you can put error bars on the, the local master equation. When you look at it as an approximation, you can here put error bars. And the error bars is of course the next term that you're missing in the expansion. So this dissipation super operator is usually second order in the system bath coupling. So you consider say third order and below to be negligible. That's why you are in the first place doing a weak coupling master equation. No, that, that should be the case because the, the thing that you are retaining, even in the exact case, is second order. So the third order would be zero for you. So if so you have to what you have to ask yourself is that if this object, so second order in the system path coupling times the internal coupling, if that thing is small enough for you to discard. Okay, so that that's would be the error mm, bar yeah. of the local master equation in this sense. So if you like the error is uh, dissipation strength cubed times internal coupling. The internal coupling doesn't necessarily have to be of the same order of dissipation strength, just has to be small for your purposes of accuracy. And you also yeah. have to be consistent mm -hmm. with the fact that you started with the approximate master equation to third order in the system bath coupling. So you cannot, after the approximation, try to be more accurate than that because that doesn't make any sense, right? So you are... Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So thank you very much, Luis, for this wonderful talk. Uh,